All right. Good morning, everybody. So this morning, you're going to be joining us for a discussion about supply chain and market outlook and some possible risk management strategies. All of us have been affected by this. Pretty much anything involving public works has been suffering through this for a while now. So this morning, we have Michael Fuss from Stantec. He is one of their senior principal practice leads. We've got Ryan Stanton, Brian Spanton. He brings 21 years of municipal and industrial wastewater experience, his background. He's got six years as a sales engineer at Goebel Sampson and 15 years in various capacities as an equipment manufacturer in the industry. And prior to that, he had 11 years background in environmental chemistry. And then we've also have Todd Pike. He's one of IMCO's top design build managers with 30 years experience in heavy civil construction industry. So with that, I'm gonna let you all start your presentation. So if they've this. All right, thanks all. Thanks for coming. So, and thanks for giving us the opportunity to come and talk to you today. So this has been a thing that we've been working on. You turn your abstract in a long time ago, right? And then I thought this is a great topic. Well, the world's changed every month as I've tried to update the slides, as I've continued to look at that. So you get a year look at, in one presentation here. So with that, uh, and I think the fundamental theme of what we're, we're gonna talk about today is there's a new normal. We're not gonna talk a whole lot about the world, the difference, we're gonna give you a little some examples, but the reality is we're in a new normal and we all have a part. That's why we're doing this together because the reality is whether it's the client, whether it's the owner, the utility, contractor, vendor, supplier, engineer, it's a team effort to get through this craziness world that we're in right now. So I'm gonna skip a few slides. So save you a little bit of time of who we are and what we didn't because you already heard about that. Um, so we're gonna talk about kind of what's some, what, is the, what have we seen over the last year? What are those market forces? Many of you know this just from the ground. We're going to talk about, we're going to also uh, talk about my friends here, Ryan and Todd from their internal, right? I'm the engineer, so I'm looking at it from a longer picture, but they're down boots in the ground. What's happening today and what's happened over the last year in this market? And then what can we do? So one of my jobs was to figure out the forecast. So try to forecast the economy today, right? Did you look at the stock market yesterday? It was terrible, right? How would you forecast that? So, you know, I, I could have probably started at the beginning of the year with just a magic eight ball, shake it a few times and come up with the answer. Uh, a Ouija board, maybe call up a palm reader, but really who we're seeing the most influential today on this economy is Mr. Powell, right? And I think his statements just last month in Wyoming, in Jackson Hole were probably an indicator of what's to come. And it's what he said, right? So we know that the Fed has one tool in their toolbox, right? It's like a sledgehammer and they're gonna solve every problem with that one tool. The good news, they've looked back and said what worked in the past and what, how do we think that we can do? And they're gonna rapidly move this, try to move the table. But the reality is interest rates will be higher, right? They are gonna slow growth and they are gonna soften the labor market, right? Unemployment's in the two to 3% right now, right? Natural rate of unemployment is about five. So that means people that don't want to work are still working. The reality is some pain is going to happen today, but it's better to take some pain today than it will be if we don't do something and it'd be much greater in the future. This is compounded today with what we're also seeing. All of us are working in this industry. We've seen the ARPA funds. We've seen the infrastructure bill. So we're having cost of money higher and new money coming in. So both are doing what? potentially increasing the cost to deliver these markets and increasing volatility. So that's why risk mitigation. These are some of the unbalanced forces, right? They're out there, whether it's, you know, I'm not gonna talk about COVID-19. We've talked about that for way too long, but what we have is we've learned about, it, learned from it, right? Labor's difficult. Something that we've seen with a war in Ukraine, right? It's not just the fact that there's a war in Ukraine, but what happens on a global scale that impacts us, right? Talking with Ryan, at one point, when, when throughout this last year, there was impacts from the oligarchs to, to provide equipment into Idaho. Like that's blew my mind, to be honest. But 
But that's the thing that we are dealing with today. It's a new normal. It's no longer just we can live in our bubble and we're going to sit at 2% growth and inflation and those types of things. So, and what are we all here for, right? We're either working for a utility, we're engineers, we're contractors, we're vendors, we're suppliers, right? We're just trying to meet citizens' expected level of service. That's a fundamental solution, right? That's what we're trying to do. And failure is not a good option, right? right? There's no day that we can't deliver clean, fresh water. I had a wastewater superintendent says, hey, I got to do this every day. There's no no flush Fridays. So we got to do this. So we got to figure it out. This is what we've seen. It's a new normal. Inflation is going to continue. Labor is going to be still be, be difficult. And supply chain issues are also going to continue. This is the forecast um, for inflation, right? It's what we've seen in the past, the peak at about eight plus percent. But what the, the market, I don't know if this thing has a pointer. Do you have a pointer? But anyway, I'll point over here. We think that it's likely going to be about 22, 23, 24 before it starts getting back to a new normal spot. And this has been consistent for the last year. This is uh, put out by ABC. It was in July. What this is trying to show is the market volatility of everything that's happened since 2000, right? It's not a flat line. It's craziness, right? We remember trying to find a two before back in uh, April in 2021, right? Trying to find it. Just couldn't get it. But that turns around pretty quick, pretty easy to tip, tip some trees down, run them through the mill, get them back out there. But still, still high. And I guess the fundamental statement is, look at the variability or the volatility and the trend is completely going up, right? And it's in the four to 60%. It's not in the two to 3%, but multiply that by 10. Looking at it on a fundamental side, right? Producer price index, the things that takes people to build, those that build things, the cost of their material, right? And, and I looked at it from a steel and plastic because this is about everything we do has got steel or plastic in it. 30% increase in steel, up to 50% increase in plastics. And this is the most recent information that you could possibly get. It's not coming down yet. I suspect it will, but not yet. This is another interesting one. This is the labor side, right? This is labor participation rate for the states that were here, right? Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. And what we've seen, this is pre-pandemic from 2000. So what labor participation rate is, is those people that are either working or trying to work divided by those people that are of the working age population. So what this is telling us is that even without the pandemic, even without everybody going home for however long in the middle of that COVID world, which is this dip, right? About 10% of the population of the working population has been out of the market. They're not even trying to work for the last 20 years. So compound that with need for people, right? Todd's out of gotta to build stuff. We gotta bring labor in. They're just not in the market. It's a challenge that we're all gonna to have to face. And then I try to say, okay, what's the, what's the fundamental purpose, right? Gross domestic product. I've tracked this for a whole year since I turned in that crazy thing, right? And started at the first year, which is really based on 2021 information. We thought that the market would, you know, kind of, we've seen an increase in gross domestic product. We thought it'd kind of balance out for a few, four, few, three or four years, and then it would balance back into about a new normal of about 2%, 2.5% per year annual growth. That's kind of over in the January time. And we started talking about, oh my God, what's going on with this economy as the world gets worse? We looked in April. They shortened that time frame. And now here we are in July, which is the latest one. Because the one thing that's also happened is I've started researching through the Fed and through all the various um, uh, prognosticators. They've been real quiet lately, right? First year, everybody's like, oh, this is the way the world is. Now, not so much. So gathering that last bit of data. But what we're seeing is because the Fed expects that it's going to work, the gross domestic products actually, they think that it's going to go below the forecast by 2023. So things are going to happen in the next year or so to get down to, I think they'll achieve it, right? It's going to be painful, but that's where we're at. So conclusion of what we've seen, right? Impacts are going to continue. The crystal ball is still pretty cloudy, but we are at a new normal. And I think the things that we're going to talk about next are things that have been around for a long time. And so I'm going to turn it over to some of my friends here to talk about what they've seen in the market, kind of what they're seeing from the supply chain, from the boots on the ground, the folks that are out there doing it. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan first. Ryan, why don't you kind of tell us about what you're seeing out there? 
Yeah, so it's, uh, I mean, it's been pretty interesting uh, trying to follow the market, uh, you know, when you're, when you're trying to bid jobs, uh, when you're trying to get vendors to supply, uh, to supply their products. Uh, it, used, it used to be, I, I started out in this industry as a clarifier guy. When I started out, you could get a clarifier for 1200 bucks a diameter foot, right? Um, as, as I moved into being a rep and, and working with Goebel Samson, you could still, you could still pick up a clarifier for about 2,500 bucks a diameter foot. Uh, anybody, anybody want to take a guess about what a clarifier might run a diameter foot today after all, after all the inflation and everything that's happened? Well, it's somewhere between 4,000 and $5,800 a diameter foot. Um, or higher, like, you know, like John said, you can, and, and what does it depend on? You know, we, we really, uh, you know, I mean, fuel costs, I mean, they're still there. Um, you know, I mean, although people would like you to believe that having it drop a dollar a gallon is, uh, is improvement, it's still uh, $2 a gallon higher than it was two years ago. Um, that's a huge impact to the freight cost. It makes actually, it makes freight a major player uh, in the cost of some of the equipment. Uh, it's sometimes uh, depending on the size of the equipment and what it is, uh, freight might be more uh, than the equipment itself. Uh, so, you know, those things are all uh, all impacting us. Raw materials, uh, as Michael had indicated, you know, I mean, who owns what companies? Uh, you know, we have an unholy alliance between Russia and China uh, financially now uh, that's uh, that's sequestered a, a big segment of the world market. Uh, you know, anytime there's a conflict in the world, regardless of whose it is uh, or where it is, uh, we, we, we stopped thinking a long time ago about where our raw materials come from. And uh, we're, being, we're being forced to think about where our raw materials are coming from today. So uh, the, the forces that are pulling on us are uh, sometimes obscure, 100% uh, uh, unpredictable today. Uh, and they are making sure that our manufacturers are taking notice uh, of what's going on. And I mean, in the past, these guys, you know, you could, as an engineer, you could, you could do a budget and the price would be held, you know, you, you, you might not have to budget again if you, if you got one, two years before you were going to bid, right? You know, for sure, 12 months before you bid, you, you could trust that it'd be held. Well, today, you know, you, if you get 30 days out of a vendor, uh, you're probably pretty lucky because uh, they, they won't guarantee too much because they can't. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit, a little bit more, uh, you know, later on, what's, uh, what's going to be the results of that or what are seeming to be the results of it. Uh, but it, it really plays to risk. Um, it's all generating risk. And our vendors are looking at their contracts today. Uh, maybe some of these guys never even signed, you know, never even read the terms and conditions and just signed it previously. Uh, but today, uh, they're looking at, you know, the force majeure events that have happened. Uh, they're looking at ways that they can uh, stay in business, some of them. Uh, we've, seen, we've seen prices go up uh, as a solution. We've seen vendors go out of business. We've seen people unceremoniously in the middle of a project send a hostage note that says, hey, we have your stuff. Uh, send money and you can see your stuff. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's really crazy. I mean, the good vendors have tried to uh, really... Uh, make sure that they held their pricing, but at what cost, you know, we have a vendor that uh, in 2021, it cost them about $6 million uh, to hold their pricing and, and to be uh, a good steward of, of our local economy uh, and, and, and keep us all whole make, and, and their reputation whole at the same time. You know, so they're, they're looking at these liabilities uh, harder today. And the real, the real uh, kicker is gonna be escalation uh, as, as it stands. Um, most of the time we don't accept escalation, right? Our funding agencies don't allow it, uh, especially on a hard bid to GCs. Um, there's uh, the funding agency funds at the level that the GC bid it at. They don't really say, Hey, but what if there's escalation? They just, they plan on the fact that you guys have covered it. Um, but the problem is it's, it's impactful enough today, uh, that we can't really just say that it's going to be the same two years from now as it is today. And so the vendors aren't able to take on all of that risk. And so there's lots of things that you can do. Uh, and we're going to be talking about those solutions. That's why we have Todd. And I want to just take a, a Todd and Michael both here, um, as well as myself. But I wanted to take a minute and just thank Michael for his efforts and Todd for his efforts, you know, because we're really here today. Uh, you know, three people you may not always expect to see together. We're sometimes at odds, sometimes different perspectives. Uh, but it really amounts to that we want to see um, partnerships and things that can help us advance uh, these projects and minimize the impacts. And, and that's what the, the result is, is just really a partnership. And that's going to be uh, what our message is today. 
So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the supply chain challenges, uh, nothing new. There's no major improvement, no you know light at the end of the tunnel at this time. Um, I don't know if you spent much time downstairs with the vendors. Uh, I've spoke with several that we work with all the time and some of them we're working with right now. And example, we have a project in Lewiston that uh, vendor delivering a new well pump and we get the pump, but we get the wrong motor and then we get the right motor and then we have the wrong coupler. And what that's a reflection of is both the labor shortages and the supply chain issues. They're just like, sometimes they just push stuff out the door. Um, you know, water and wastewater, we get quotes as a contractor on bid day. We'll get a quote for a million and a half dollars worth of pipe and fittings. And it's good for two days. It is not guaranteed delivery at all. And sometimes and the price will adjust upon delivery. So as a contractor, how does that work? You know, you want to lump some job. Um, how much risk do we want to take on? That's one thing contractors do well is we manage risk. I mean, it's part of being a contractor. However, in this kind of market, there's, do you want to be a little bit or do you want to have contingency? So the challenges um, continue. Switch gear, like electrical, it's always been a long lead item. Well, now get in line and get in line as soon as you can, uh, because you're talking 12 to 18 months. Um, there's just, it's the uncertainty that we all live in. I mean, it's the uncertainty of the times. We live it day to day, watch the news. That uncertainty translates into this market and into our market. No one wants to guarantee anything. No one wants to put their name on anything because they don't want to let you down. And, and like, you know, Ryan's team, a lot of it is out of his hands. I have a contract with Ryan, but he has contracts with maybe three or four others. So it just trickles down. And so I call Ryan and say, what the heck's going on? He's like, well, I got these three things. So it's a challenge and it's not improving. Um, price escalation. So as you saw, we're continuing to trend up, um, steel settling down a little bit, but we're back to this uncertainty. That's when, you, when we're looking at the market as a contractor and we're reaching out for quotes and we're reaching out to, you know, how long will you hold your quote? You know, we turn in a bid, you guys want 60 days, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't get it for a week, maybe, you know, they might hold their quote for a week. And even though it looks like it's improving and kind of feels maybe like it's improving, to Ryan's point, um, it's a new normal like there's no certainty no one's going to back anything no one's putting they're not supporting anything and you know what does it look like going forward no one from our perspective is looking much beyond a couple months because you you just don't know is there going to be another war is there going to be another pandemic we just don't know um and i won't talk about inflation um michael hit that pretty good but um again we're all living it and it's reflecting in our market. It's making construction pricing very difficult, um, you know, to, to hold that price for any given time. So, so this, right. So we got to deal with it, right. It's about risk. It's about risk. And so that's what, and I, and again, I like Ryan and Todd, I want to thank you for letting us talk. I really want to thank Ryan and Todd because the reality it's a team, right? We are a team. I call these guys all the time on stuff and I'm a biggest pain in, the, in their butt when I'm like, Hey, how do I do it? And, Call my buddy Todd. Hey, how are we going to build some things? And so we want to talk about how do we how do we look forward from a risk mitigation perspective? Hopefully, this can give you a little bit of tips. And it's nothing earth shattering, right? These things have been around for a long time, but the pandemic, this change has really increased the awareness and the need to address these things. This, I think, is the consultant's friend, right? We all love to have this chart because if we do a class five estimate, good enough, plus or minus a hundred. I'm going to come almost throw a dart and get that close. Right? And what contractor can say, well, if I can, I'll put you a bid in and it might be 100% more, it might be 50% less. At the end of the day, I'll let you know. So, what can you do? Right? If you're a person, I'm a former public works director. So, I had to stand in front of a public entity and say, this is our budget. And I couldn't say, well, I need 20 million or maybe 40 million somewhere. Right? You got to put a number out there. So, how do we create the certainty? How, what are those tools in our toolbox? So that as we move forward, from an engineer side, maybe what you can do is move your design ahead a little bit, right? Be at 30% design early on so that you've set, you have information that you're basing your budget on. You're not going into a budget at a class five estimate. You're maybe you're in a class three estimate. 
So your variability is much smaller. And then you can start to account for risk. And, you can, and we're gonna talk about that in a bit. The other thing that I would recommend is that in that early design time, consider risk, build your risk register early account for risk, identify those risk elements, something like, like right of way or property that you need to acquire, right? We know it's gonna be difficult, right? Rarely is it like, yeah, I'll send you a dollar and you're gonna send me all the property I need. There's some legal process, but you can account for that. You can account for it in time, you can account for it in dollars. And that's it, it's an awareness, it's passing it forward. And then like me, right, engage your partners. Engage your partners in the process because they can help. We're all here to help. And with that, I'll turn over to Todd. Oh, sorry, back to Todd, your section, engaging partners. Yeah. <clears throat> so like um, Michael was talking about, you know, identifying risks early, um, engage your partners, you know, lean on your, you should be leaning on your engineers, leaning on stakeholders, figuring out, do you have long lead items? Do you have um, critical components to your project? Do you have um, difficult uh, below ground geotechnical conditions? Look at your project, look at what you're doing. Op you guys probably all work in an operating plant. What does this mean for your operators? How are you gonna engage the plant? Um, you know, build your team, surround yourself, lean. You can, and we're gonna talk a little bit about how contractually you can lean on a contractor, but you know, reach out to Orion, reach out to a contractor, start informing your project early. Um, oftentimes, you know, engineers have us that they can lean on, encourage them to inform you with what are the challenges. Um, identify constructability concerns, call Ryan, find out what the market is for a clarifier if you're putting in a new clarifier. You're gonna have to take a proactive stance to make sure you protect your budget and you deliver to your constituents what you said you were going to and, and not get up in front of that council and ask for another 20% in the middle of the job. It's, that's the new normal. You can't just say, okay, you go design it. Let me know when you're done building it. You need to step forward in this process and be a part of that team early on. Um, that's gonna protect you, it's, or not you, but protect your, you know, your project and, and protect your city or your county, wherever you work for your, your utility is by being forward in this new process. So Ryan, what's some of the tricks, right? So one of the options is early procurement. What are some of those things that you've seen? Well, <clears throat> there's, uh, you know, the first and foremost, I guess, uh, with early procurement, a lot of people think you can't competitively bid that. Um, you can, uh, you know, doing a pre-selection, uh, what, what you're saying, especially as a municipality is, hey, we're going to accept uh, some of the risk, uh, meaning that you might have to pay for a submittal. Uh, if, some, if everything goes south and you can't order the equipment, maybe you're going to have to pay for a submittal before you get your, your contractor on board. Um, that, is, that is a risk, um, but you can uh, bring in competitors and evaluate it. And oftentimes it gives you um, a better outlook. Uh, your, your engineering costs go down uh, because you're able to engineer around a single vendor. Uh, there are single requirements. Uh, so you, you can even save costs. Maybe your building gets smaller because you can uh, you, you can engineer for uh, that one vendor that you know is going to save building costs. You can look at your building costs and the total construction. You know, equipment oftentimes is a, you know, is a much smaller fraction than, uh, than the civil costs of a project. And, and so if you can save civil costs by, by going one direction versus another and knowing that up front, um, you know, you're, you're going to be, you know, well ahead. Uh, the do's and I guess the do's and the don'ts, uh, you know, it's do educate yourselves. Um, that's the order of the day. I mean, don't don't say, well, I don't know where my engineers got that. Uh, you know, if, if you're the engineer, don't go, well, I, I don't know, that's a contractor's job. You know, don't you know, you just it, take take ownership and make sure that you're you are being informed. And, and one of the things that you can get through early procurement and ordering is transparency, right? If you get people on the on the bus early enough, you know, you don't have this finger pointing, you kind of get their best work, because uh, everybody if you have to go to bid all the time, uh, and, you, and you're working from that situation, everybody reserves a little bit because they don't want to put their best stuff out there because they want they don't want to expose their advantage uh, before they have a chance to bid it, and then have their competitor, you know, just embrace it and, and carry forward with the same advantage they thought of, you know. Uh, so, you know, you get that transparency, you don't, you don't have the constraints of a contract where we go, oh, I can't talk to, you know, I can't talk to uh, the municipality anymore because Michael has a contract because Todd has a contract and, 
And uh, we have, uh, you know, I mean, I can look at these guys and I can say, listen, my vendor can't deliver this for, you know, 18 months. And here's why you guys specified the Alan Bradley this. And, and if I can go with square D, I can deliver it in six months. What's important to you? Is 18 months good enough? No, my funding window won't allow me to go 18 months before I receive your, your VFD. So I'm going to have to go with a square D. So we can talk about those little things that actually further a project and put us all in a better position if we get on the, if we get on the bus together earlier so well and also we've had this conversation amongst us todd what are some of the things that you see as important when you're doing that early from a contract perspective here's we're gonna order stuff good luck here you go yeah um how many have done early procurement okay perfect so I've, i'm sure you've ran into challenges with early procurement um the biggest challenge from a contracting or contractor's perspective that we've ran into um, and and we embrace it. Don't get me wrong. It's it's it helps the job. It helps um, schedule. So there's all the reasons to do it. But the challenges we've ran into is make sure your PO with the equipment supplier and your contract align. Oftentimes you negotiate the PO. You have these you know purchasing terms, liability schedule, maybe even LDs, and then you have a contract that maybe the engineer or your attorney put together. Well. They don't align. So we get, we bid the job. We're looking at this thing and, you know, uh, you say you want the job to be done in August of a certain year, but Ryan doesn't have to deliver his equipment until July. Well, that doesn't give us enough time to install it. Or maybe his, you know, his payment terms that you've negotiated are set at a certain, you know, 30, 60, 90 submittals, you know, manufacturer, but mine's still on a progress payment. So then I'm looking at bankrolling this and carrying that. And because of those terms, which I price into my price, knowing that I'm going to have to do that. Right. So make sure you take the time to align those contracts, you know, have, I hate to say this, but have an attorney spend some time going through it. It will be benefit for the whole project. And that's the biggest challenge that we've found um, with early procurement. Thanks, Todd. And now, again, as a bit of a recovering public works director, um, when you're putting your budget together, right? Those, how, how many of you have a public budget that you have to stand in front of an, an agency to talk about? Oh yeah, a few of you, good. So how many of you like, I'm halfway through the project and I want to go back to the mayor and council and say, hey, I need another $10 million. Is that the most comfortable conversation? Not, to, yeah, 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 not so much, right? So how can you address that, right? This is something that we're certainly advocating for. We see this in our program delivery of projects is a management reserve, right? We all do estimates, right? They're best guess, especially when you're out in that planning stage. If we've moved our design a little bit forward, we can get a little bit more accurate. But there's also some things that we can we can account for, things that are the unknown unknowns or the known unknowns, and build those in into a management reserve, right? It doesn't have to be part of the contract, but it is part of the budget. So it gives you that tool. So essentially, you're identifying a budget that's, you know, this is your estimate, this is your management reserve, and this is your budget. So that as you're bringing this forward over time of a project, I gave an hour presentation on this, so I'll try to do this quick. But as you move forward in the time of your project, you're identifying those risks. And if you've identified those risks, you can create contingencies for those risks. It becomes transparent, right? Especially when you're talking to, you know, elected official or even Joe Citizen. Hey, I might run into groundwater. I need to set aside some dollars in case that happens in the project. I may not know that for a fact yet, but I need to protect myself from a budget perspective because I don't want to come back and say, hey, I need more money. I know I'm going to need more money. I'm just not sure exactly 100% what that is. Doesn't mean that you have to commit it. So as you move forward in your project, you move the unknown unknowns to more known unknowns. That's your contingency. And then as your estimate continues to change, you're able to move between fund balance management reserve to contingency. And as your bid comes in, that's the number, right? That's at the end of the day. Todd's going to put his number down there. Here's what it's going to cost to, get, to do it. And then some risk happens. So we got to deal with that from our contingency, but we have a budget to pull from. The tricky part about it is, is do you have the authority? And that's what gets your councils, your mayors, your elected officials, or your citizens comfortable, right? Identify who has the authority. We've budgeted for it. We all have fund balances. If you don't, 
you're in the big hurt, world hurt anyway. But right, you you just need to identify the authority of when that. Maybe it's the council, even though they've said it in the budget. In order to get past some number, some known bid or, or some known estimate or contingency, we have to go back to the council and say, hey, remember we got this budget. I'd like to dip into that management reserve a little bit. You know, identify your construction contingencies, put that out there, be public. It's not a big, you know, if you're in a public entity, everything's public anyway. So why have nothing to hide it? Track your changes, be and maintain your transparency. And at the end of the day, all things work, right? Your costs are probably going to be up, but you're going to be under your budget and you can take some of that fund balance. There's that management reserve back to your fund balance and put it on your next project. It's just a way to manage your way through risk. And it gives you that tool in your toolbox. And you're not having to go back to the council and say, Oh, by the way, my $10 million project is now 15 million and I'm not sure what to do. So with that, there's some other tools that you have in your toolbox. Well, Todd and I are members of DBIA. Todd, I'll let you handle this one. Do you okay. mind? Um, how many have engaged in al uh, alternative del delivery projects? Have you enjoyed them? Have they been successful generally? Yeah, good. Some are so, so I get that. Um, so we already talked about early material and equipment procurement, so I won't spend time on that. Um, so you got design build. So Idaho, Washington, and Oregon all have laws that allow you to approach projects. Now I'm going to say not every project is set up for design build. I mean, if you have a pretty straightforward project, you don't need to do design build, but if you have a, you know, working in an operating, um, plant, that you're going to interrupt operations, um, you have or you have uh, challenging soil conditions, or um, there's lots of reasons. You have a critical piece of equipment that you want to design around for your plant. So you have design build, you have progressive design build, and you have uh, CMGC or GCCM, depending on what state you're in. Um, the difference between the three, just quickly, is design build. Um, as a design builder, um, I work with Michael and his team or any engineer, and I give you a fixed price to deliver a project. Um, and the challenges with design build is as an owner or client, you need to be very prescriptive about what you want. You have to make sure you're clear about the outcomes of your project. And that way, as a design builder, I can make sure we design around it, have the pricing and the cost to do it. Progressive design build is kind of DBIA's new push. Um, and what that looks like, uh, we're actually working in Lewiston on the second progressive design build in the state of Idaho. And we're actually working um, for the city of Everett on the second progressive design build for the state of Washington. And so what that looks like is you engage your design builder. Um, there's still a cost matrix. Sometimes it's fee, sometimes it's GCs, but otherwise you're, pretty much hiring your design builder based on their qualifications and the team that they bring forward. Um, I encourage you, if you do that process, make sure that you engage the team. You're hiring the team. You're going to live with this team. It's about cost is still important, but it's about the team. And that's what makes the difference. Um, and then again, Michael and I, or my engineer and I will be working together. And the nice thing about progressive is we work together as a team with your stakeholders, with you, with operators to develop a cost, develop a schedule, develop a plan, um, do early procurement if we need to, because of schedule, you're part of the process, you're engaged in the process. I will tell you though, from as, uh, as an owner or a client for us, it's a little more work for you up front because you do need to be engaged. You can't just hand over the keys and say, you know, let me know when you're done. You need to be engaged in that process. You need to have your people engaged in that process. But just like anything, if you work harder up front, it makes the, the end easier. And then at the end, you're negotiating your GMP, your guaranteed maximum price with your design builder through a very transparent open book process. So you know what you're spending so you can have cost confidence. And then the last one, which is very similar to progressive design build you on board, a general or general contractor in this case, um, and you already have your engineer and you're somewhere between 30, zero and 30% design. Again, you're bringing them on board to do the same thing. Your schedule, 
negotiating costs, looking at early procurement, all those things. Those are all things that all three states have available to you. Some have challenges, or Idaho is a little more uh, uh, easy to manage or get through some of those processes. For example, state of Washington, you have to go to a board and get approval. But for those critical infrastructure projects, I can guarantee you it's worth the time. And if you find the right uh, member, it will help you out. So um, those are just three tools or four tools in your toolbox to help you mitigate these challenges. And again, it's not for every job. It's for those jobs where you have some type of critical infrastructure or operating or, you know, you, you can you can write a contract all day that says thou shall do this and thou shall do that. And you know, at the end of the day, you can't put enough words in there to really describe your project to a contractor to make sure they understand all of it. And that's where you end up with change orders. So doing a process like this takes a lot of that out because the contractor is part of that whole development process. Bring us home. All right, so we know risks have always existed. Um, everybody's way more aware of them today than they ever have been by necessity. Um, you know, the uncertainty, uncertainty is kind of the new order of the day. Uh, we're probably a couple of years away from being more certain uh, than we are today, uh, which means we just have to do what we can to get, to get more certain or as certain as we can. Uh, that exists in transparency, uh, uncertainty and fear and what you're, what you're worried about on a project starts to dwindle a little bit more uh, as you firm up things, uh, the more uh, the faster that you can get a team together of people that are all going to be working in the same direction on the project. Uh, and that, that includes the owner, the engineer, the contractor, the vendors, uh, the sooner you're going to be able to, uh, you know, kind of firm that up a little bit and firm those costs up a little bit. Uh, that participation also uh, usually makes people incentivized uh, to do maybe a little more thorough job, uh, take a little more ownership, and maybe even hold their costs a little better. Um, and so, uh, you know, risk mitigation is good practice, good times and bad. Uh, if you don't have risk mitigation strategies from the start, you should, uh, because they really dictate what you do moving forward uh, if you have a risk mitigation plan. Um, so the biggest message overall uh, from the three of us, we're all standing here together. You have partners in the process. Uh, it doesn't have to look like this. I mean, it can be another rep, another contractor, another engineer. Our message isn't to market for ourselves. It's to tell you that that kind of, that kind of partnership has worked really well for all of us in delivering a better project and making sure that our vendors perform and, and getting an, ultimately a better result for the end user. So, um, and, that, and that includes you guys. I mean, so really the message is I'll be vigilant in, in learning and being engaged in the project. And uh, thank you from all three of us. Thank you for your time today and your attendance. We, uh, we really appreciate it and like to turn it over now for questions. Yeah, with the uh, increased volatility risk existing out there, um, are you seeing owner clients more interested in design build to shift that risk with the contractor versus the design build? Are you seeing uh, yeah, especially in the water wastewater. Um, for example, DBIA, I don't know if many of you have been there, but they actually have uh, every year they have a water wastewater specific um, design build um, um, conference just to educate people, educate owners on that process and how to use that process. Like I said, uh, we're doing the second uh, in both states uh, progressive design builds. And I think um, as we move forward, uh, we're going to see more and more of that. Uh, I would like to see, as a contractor, uh, I would like to see more and more of that. Uh, we are interested in engaging and being a part of the conversation early on and supporting these projects. So, yeah, I, I think that's very much where we're going. It's more of a just a more of a curiosity with existing projects that may have started probably in say the last 12 to 18 months and are heavy into uh, construction and are going to go out for three or four more years what's going to happen to those types of setups I take that I guess not. Go ahead, so so the question is is uh 
what's going to happen? I'm in the middle of construction and what's next? Is that, is that kind of the thing? Well, I guess the answer is interest rates are going to go up, right? So it depends on how good your contract is. That's going to be what it is. What we've seen, I think the, the thing that we've all seen is people are reading their contracts. The vendors, I mean, honestly, sometimes it's like, you know, they just made a sale when they were happy in the past, the variability wasn't that much. They pretty much will deliver on time. But the variability is so great right now that these contracts matter. Contracts matter. And I think that's the answer. You're going to manage to your contract. I would suggest that you take an aggressive stance on your identifying risks and thinking about that in, in the future, thinking about that as you go forward, right? What things are out there? I think from a project management perspective, from an owner side, you have to be thinking well ahead of where the contractor is, where, well ahead of where your project is, of what are those things that might go wrong and manage according, right? Contractors are great. They're going to figure out how to do it day to day. They know what they're doing every day. But someone needs to be thinking ahead, right? So that they're prepared. And as an owner side, you're prepared to go forward, right? And read the contracts and give people a heads up. I mean, it's a team. It's never fun to be in the gotcha perspective, right? It's not like, hey, I'm going to see them get, step in a hole here in a few hours and you let them do it. If you're like, hey, this issue is coming, we're seeing it. Call your contractor and say, hey, I've got this thing. Are you ready? He might have to call a vendor and say, can we get a different product right away? Because we still need to stay on schedule. Communicate. Yeah, any, anything that falls short, uh, you should have your risk mitigation strategy ready. And if it falls short even a little bit, it should get right into the risk mitigation strategy. Um, the biggest thing is don't be suspicious of each other. Um, I mean, do what you can to be uh, personable with one another and know each other so that you can get rid of that suspicion and you can talk honestly and openly about things. You know, I mean, I don't think anybody wants to see anybody go out of business because they made a small mistake or because they had a market condition impact them. Uh, but you don't want to be taken advantage because somebody's adjusting their pricing because they think they can. Uh, so, you know, I, I get on get on the same page with your vendors, your partners. Get make sure they're partners. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. All right. Let's give them a hand.